I mean, maybe we could transition to that. Like one, one thing about, yeah. so this is from a London Review of Books, and he wrote this in, uh, in 1993 after the signing of the uh, the Oslo Accords. And um, yeah, so Edward Said, like I, 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 I think I read Orientalism uh, in, in college, but reading this essay, I mean, I always knew his position in Oslo. But um, I never actually read uh, his, his essay and reading this, like it is very sharp and insightful. And I was surprised by that. And it makes me want to like go back to like his actual, like the text that he's known for to see, you know, like what, what else is in there that might be useful to me? Because it is a sharp analysis in, in different respects. And um, like one thing, like, okay, so just titling it the morning after, like one thing that I do miss, like in the age of, you know, internet uh, blogs and shit is... Like, like you can't title things just to title them. You have to, you know, you have to like worry about like, well, is anybody going to click on this? Is this going to get picked up by Google? Right. So you have to like, you know, you always have to do like functional sort of titles, even if it's not clickbaity, they're going to be functional in some way here. Like you could, you know, put this in a journal, title it, whatever poetic or half poetic, whether or not it fails, whether or not it works, you know, you have that option. So I, I sort of miss that, but, um, yeah, like w w one thing about the Edward Said piece that that I think is uh, uh, fascinating is just how, um, like he talks about the propaganda campaign that was uh, ongoing in the '80s versus the '90s and how it switched, right? Where and I talked about this before on the channel, but uh, of course, like the PLO, yes, they did engage in terrorism, and in the charter, it did say it explicitly that they're seeking the destruction of Israel. They weren't going to recognize Israel, but in exchange for the possibility of a peace talk. Uh, they exchanged, um, uh, I forget what they were called, Articles of Mutual Recognition, which is, a, if it is called that, it's a misnomer because um, Yasser Arafat, like in his articles that he sent to Israel, he had this like like long like paragraph. It was like very effusive about like, we're going to respect Israel. It has the right to exist. It should be under international law. And uh, uh, Rabin sent back, uh, something that's a little like two lines, you know, like saying we're gonna sit down and talk, right? And kind of like just you know whipping that boy into shape, right? We're gonna we're gonna tell you where, where, who you are, right? If you want to get a little uppity with us, so first of all, not not actual like mutual recognition, and uh, so in the '80s, you know, there was this like propaganda campaign. Uh, Arafat is terrible. Arafat is this that that. I obviously didn't live through it because I was uh, not uh, conscious for most of those years. And I was not conscious for most of the 90s either. And I would not have been able to appreciate how the coverage, in fact, changed from the 80s into the 90s because once Arafat is a team player and he's willing to more or less sign away Palestinian rights in exchange for things that, um, I mean, like we could say in hindsight, it was a terrible decision because literally nothing came of it. Uh, I don't, I forget whether settlement construction was in violation of uh, Oslo specifically, or if it was just in violation of the spirit of Oslo, but, you know, s settlements like, like doubled or tripled, you know, uh, within a few years of like trying to implement Oslo. So at a very minimum, right, you're going to have some level of Palestinian resistance and some level of feeling like we, you know, we've been tricked. Um, but yeah, like once you're able to like sign everything away, once you're able to to once you do everything that's asked of you, you become a team player in that regard. Media is going to treat you nicely. So what that's one aspect of it that I think uh, I underappreciated, not knowing, you know, obviously not being conscious during that time. Yeah, it's it well, it's nice, you know, growing up in a pretty right wing conservative town, you know, uh, it was it, it's right below the Wisconsin border, and they're like, oh, was it? Even though Illinois was never going to go for Trump, uh, it, there was a Trump office there because they could do operations up into southern Wisconsin uh, through that office because it was like a 10 minute drive away from the Wisconsin border. Um, and, you know, it was it was Bush country. It always went extremely. So so it, like for me, I always grew up hearing about Yasser Arafat as a terrorist. You know, mm -hmm. he's a monster. He wants to kill Jewish people. And it's so it's so nice and refreshing to just read an essay that's basically like, no, the problem with Arafat is that he's an egotist, is mm -hmm. that he's a narcissist, that he puts his own uh, political advancement and retrenchment of his place in the Palestinian struggle as like a prominent leader above the actual like interests. Like he refused earlier uh, accords that would have done more for Palestinian rights because it didn't put him at the center of it. And he ends up signing this thing that does nothing, but it at least acknowledges the PLO as the 
as the leaders of the Palestinians or whatever and puts him at the center of Palestinian politics. So it's mm -hmm. it's nice to read a much more uh, grounded take on Arafat than I than I was raised with in in my in my home milieu. Mm -hmm. And it's it's also it also is interesting to read in this essay again, nineteen ninety three. Good essay. Yeah, it's we have really, re really sharp political analysis, mm -hmm. and it's not forty five hundred you know, words. Anybody can I, read I, it. I, I mean, suggest you do. Yeah, Said is like kind of lumped in with other postmodern and postcolonial theorists, but I, and I don't know, maybe his theoretical work is more impenetrable and obscurantist, like a lot of that stuff is. But this very straightforward language, very easy to follow arguments are plain as day and. Uh, you know, easy to pick out and either agree with or refute if you so di desire to refute it. You know, I mean, it makes you wonder why more of this kind of discourse is not written as clearly as clearly as this when it's like when it when it is so much more appealing than a lot of that milieu. And I, I, I too would like to read a lot of his more like theoretical work. And I hope it's as clear as as this, because this essay suggests that he is a good writer to me, at least about politics, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, and like one thing in the essay that I also, I guess, underappreciated was, uh, I didn't know this detail until reading it, but it seems as if there was always this reluctance all around the world to have any kind of census that would include Palestinians within it because, and I mean, this is like very apropos now, simply because when you look at what's happening in Gaza, uh, I mean, like I argued this before, right. But this, this whole concept of greater Israel, which began you know, a, a very long time ago, it intensified uh, during the foundation of Israel, this idea that whatever our legal borders are going to be, we're going to always go past them, past them, past them, however far we could get away with such. And this is apparently going as recently as Netanyahu, right? Because he, you know, he's always uh, saber rattling about annexing the West, the West Bank. He's always, uh, he's accelerating settlements, right? He's showing maps where Israel is all of... Um, uh, the entire territory, meaning Gaza is part of Israel, West Bank is part of Israel. There's no Palestinians essentially uh, in, in that world. And, um, you know, like it just, it's very obvious, right? If you just look at the ethnic cleansing from the foundations in 1948 up until now, uh, there there is this ethnic cleansing that is ongoing, right? This disappearance of Palestinians. Uh, I was just kind of uh, surprised at the level of just extreme enthusiasm that we saw in uh, like if you look at some of the uh, tweets like around the time of the start of the Gaza siege and you have like all these demands of like opening up a, a humanitarian corridor uh, where, you know, Palestinians could escape, let's say, into Egypt or some other state uh, temporarily while, you know, the war uh, uh, dies down. So many of the people there are clearly like really like rabidly pro-Israel. And it's so obvious with even the language that they're using that they want Palestinians to essentially escape into Egypt, the door gets shut behind them forever, and now there are no more Palestinian people right within uh, that part of, uh, I guess, uh, uh, Gaza or that part of Israel, that part of Palestine, whatever. And um, you know, this is this is just kind of this ongoing project, right? It's it's been happening for such a long time. You see direct statements, everyone from Ben Gurion to other uh, leaders, they're always saying the same thing. And uh, the problem is, like, you can't escape from that logic since if Israel wants to be an ethno state, and people say stuff like, well, it's not technically an ethno state because you do have other, uh, uh, you know, nationalities there. That's true, but they also have some sort of cap on how many Jews versus everybody else. Now, well, yeah, that's, I, I mean, that, that's, it's, that's total horseshit because, yeah, I, they're, they're, I mean, the reason they're an ethno state is because there's a bunch of people that live within basically their borders, their functional, like, mm -hmm sphere of power or whatever that don't get a vote that don't get a say basically in what their economy looks like they are not free to import you mm -hmm. know materials aid things like that it has to go through israel first and be cataloged and distributed you know according to israel's assessment of what like the gaza strip gaza strip and the west bank and thing, or gaza specifically you know need and get like that's you, you, you know, I mean, it is just, it's just blatantly apartheid. Like the fact mm -hmm. that there are Palestinians in Israel proper that have the right to vote and have political or, or Arabs and Palestinians, I should say, because part of the, the, the argument for the ethnic cleansing is this whole, like, well, look at how much 
look like look at all this territory of Islam, or you'll get people say, look at all these places where Arabs live, and Israel only has this one little territory. Like, how can you say that they don't deserve it? And it's like, mm -hmm. well, I mean, like different, like, like Arab is a really broad tent, and the people in and, and like Palestinians, I think are like it's it's questionable or or at least like they're not strictly arab they are culturally arab but they're mm -hmm. not necessarily ethnically like you know derived from the same stock as like the people yeah i mean they're they're, they're clearly Iraq, they're clearly different Lebanon. and yeah and, like and, different. and they, like, they know they, they, they know that they're palestinians different. they don't yeah. want to be just absorbed into and, uh, like other and places, everybody knows other this. that's the thing places. you know you know, like yeah. everybody knows this, which is why like they were so against this idea of like a census, right? Because if Palestinians would have any level of like self-consciousness, right? Some sort of national consciousness. We've got Palestinians in Egypt. We've got Palestinians in, in Palestine. We've got Palestinians uh, in Lebanon. If they are so self-conscious about this fact, they become, you know, another kind of de facto pressure group. Um, and, uh, you know, like, I, I think, you know, if a lot of this does go down to the fact that generally speaking, you know, this is, you know, this is more applicable to Israel, but it's also applicable to some degree to other, um, uh, to like Arab states where Palestinians just seem like a total problem to them. Like they wish, they wish that Palestinians would just kind of disappear because now they have this, this millstone around their neck, right? Uh, Saudi Arabia, and, whoa, we have to suspend our normalization agreements with Israel. Things are, were supposed to get easier for us. We were supposed to open up new avenues of trade. We were supposed to uh, open up new avenues of military cooperation. But now we're going to have to deal with these goddamn Palestinians again. These, you know, like who just don't. That's the thing. Uh, I sent you that that Egyptian comedian who was on Piers Morgan, right? One thing that he said is like, you know, they keep, they just keep trying to keep Palestinians and they just never seem to die, right? Which is true, right? They just, they, they, they refuse to disappear. And this is a problem. So the best that they could hope for is if we could just get them uh, absorbed into other Arab states and like be happy about it, you know, that's going to be enough. And it, it kind of, I guess it shouldn't surprise me, but one of the Jews that I uh, was speaking to and um, he happens to be like a bit more liberal, I guess, in some of the stuff. And yeah, I mean, he was telling me stuff like, yeah, like, uh, you know, I was just reading more about the conflict the past week. And uh, one thing that shocked me was I was like, just listening to interviews with some of the Hamas militants and they're 18 years old, 19 years old, 20 years old. And I remember when I was that age and I was a child and the fact that, you know, uh, they feel compelled to do this, obviously there's something bad going on and we need to address that. And yet um, when we were talking about like the Palestinian people in general, he said something like, you know, like, the, you know, the, they, they could, you know, just get, you know, we could like set something up for them where like they could go into like, you know, an Arab nation and, and live there happily. And it's like, but that's exactly the point. Like, like whether or not, you know, you yeah, feel like, an ethnic, live there. like yeah, yeah, whether or not you feel like an ethnic cleanser, whether or not you feel like more liberal in this question, you are like your instinct, your knee jerk reaction is they should be absorbed by another say, which honestly, look to me, being a cosmopolitan, being someone that wants some sort of like Marxist style, whatever, like centuries from now, that's like, you know, the, the way that we conduct ourselves. Uh, I don't like nationalism. I, I wish that everybody would just feel themselves as part of the same exact, you know, continuum and, and not uh, take these kinds of positions. But A, nationalism is real. And B, the, the you know, the, the Jewish guy that was saying this to me about Palestinians, he would never, ever accept the same thing for Jews. Like imagine if Jews were told, oh, we're going to deconstruct your state. We're going to put you here. We're going to put you there. We're going to put you there. And you could be absorbed by America. You could be absorbed in Norway. You could be absorbed in France. And that's going to be sufficient. That's going to be enough. They would never accept you know, such a, a eventuality for themselves. And because they don't accept it for themselves, why do you expect Arabs to do that? And I think it kind of goes down to what you said. And these are not like psychopaths or even necessarily saying this, but what it comes out to ultimately is Palestinian lives in aggregate, they are worth less individually than individual Israeli lives. You could see this even in like the hostage transfers that have been occurring right for decades now. It's always something like, you know, we, we trade one Israeli hostage for something like, you know, uh, uh, five, 10, you know, more Palestinian prisoners um that that in and of itself like you could see what the scale means like literally palestinian life is less valuable in that regard it's just such a difficult problem i mean there's 
the, the like the whole world is invested in Israel now, you know, like the whole yeah, I mean the the success of the state as a, I mean I mean the success of the state just as a as a state entity for like managing affairs in the Middle East or having an outpost is is so directly tied into a lot of these states and now everyone's like la lashed to the yoke of this like you know this ethno-nationalist uh project